very much. Thanks, Daryl, for organizing this and for inviting me. It's uh, great to be back here and to see lots of old friends and meet some new ones, I hope. Um, what I'd like to do today is talk about uh, numerical methods for finite value methods for solving hyperbolic systems of equations, systems of conservation laws, and some, cons and some software that we've been developing over the years for implementing these methods. And do this in the context of some applications and focus more on the applications really than on the math today. Uh, it's early on a Saturday morning. I don't think we need, want to get into too many equations. So I'll just kind of give you the basic ideas of what goes on with these methods and then concentrate on showing some of the applications that we're currently looking at with these. Um, so I want to first talk about one application to get things going about uh, volcanic flows. The picture on the previous slide was uh, Mount St. Helens, and we've been looking at some uh, modeling of eruptions of volcanoes, in particular Mount St. Helens, which is not far from Seattle, uh, and tell you a little bit about that to kind of set the stage, and then talk briefly again about uh, sort of the numerical methods and how they work in this software, and then uh, finish up talking about a couple of other examples, uh, tsunami modeling and lithotripsy and shockwave therapy in medicine. Uh, before I forget, I, there's a number of people who I've been collaborating with over the years on these methods and software and, and various applications. Some of the people involved in the work I'll talk about today are listed here. Uh, in particular, a couple of grad students are here today, uh, David George and Kirsten Fagnan. And it's nice that there was support available to bring graduate students to this conference as well. Uh, here's a picture of some of these people. Let's see, this is uh, Marika Planti who is working on the volcanic flow. This is a picture at Mount St. Helens about a year ago when we were down taking a look at the landscape there. Marika just finished her thesis last spring on, on volcanoes and is now in Paris. Uh, Donna Calhoun, who was a postdoc and instructor who also coincidentally moved to Paris just recently. Seems to be a trend in that direction. Uh, Joe Dufek is a graduate student in Earth and Space Sciences modeling volcanic flows. And Dave George, who's here, is working on tsunami modeling. Okay, volcanic flows. There's actually a lot of interesting fluid dynamics related to volcanoes. And we've only looked at, at a few aspects of this, but I thought I'd mention uh, and just show you some of the wide variety of things that one could look at here. There's the flow of magma in the conduit, the molten rock under the Earth. Uh, as that magma reaches the surface, if it doesn't have very much gas dissolved in it, then it just kind of oozes out as a lava flow. But if it has a lot of dissolved gas in it, then as it reaches the surface and the pressure is lower, it will often sort of explode uh, as the gas expands. And that's when you get this sort of phase transition. The molten lava becomes uh, small bits of ash and rock that go flying out from the volcano. So you get two different sorts of volcanic flows depending on how much gas is in the magma and whether it has a chance to escape before it reaches the surface. Um, another aspect which was what was shown on that first slide is sort of an atmospheric shock wave when the mountain first explodes there's a pressure wave that moves out as from an explosion or something uh, that's one thing we've looked at um, there's also the ash plume the, the rising column of, of hot uh, ash in the case where you have sort of explosive eruptions that can rise up in Plinian columns or they can collapse into pyroclastic flows, which are flows that have a lot of hot uh, gas and dust and, and rocks in them. Um, lahars, which are mud flows, which if, for example, when Mount St. Helens erupted, there were a lot of glaciers there, so all that water melted and, and gave rise to mud flows and debris flows as it picks up rocks and trees and cars and houses and sweeps them down the mountainside. So there's a whole set of different flows, probably others that I've forgotten here, that can be modeled and that people are looking at modeling numerically these days. So here's the uh, topography of Mount St. Helens. This is the mountain. This is looking, this is off to the north side. What happened when it erupted was there was a sort of dome that built up on the mountain that uh, exploded at some point. There was a landslide that uh, eased the pressure and that you had enough gas dissolved in it that it exploded northwards and swept over these ridges here as the initial eruption. And then throughout the course of the next several days, there was a high ash plume that rose up um, 
from the volcano. So one thing we've looked at as sort of a, a starting problem here is just solving the Euler equations of compressible gas dynamics in three dimensions on this sort of topography. Um, so this was a, a test we did. We were at the time developing three-dimensional uh, adaptive mesh refinement routines in this software uh, and getting them to work on non-Cartesian grids. So here we had a hexahedral grid that sort of follows the train. Uh, and we started with just some sort of balloon of high pressure inside the crater here and then let that balloon burst and looked at how that shock wave propagated out. So this would sort of model the initial uh, sound wave that came out when the uh, mountain first started to erupt. So this is a three-dimensional computation. This is just one slice through that computation that's shown here just to show you the kind of grids that we're using. So this is a slice of these three-dimensional hexahedral grid cells that are logically rectangular but are mapped to this topography. Uh, and we're using a very coarse grid out here where nothing is happening. And then there's a region in here where you can see it's been refined by a factor of two, I guess. And then there's another region in here where the grid lines aren't drawn uh, because it would be just all black where it's been refined by an additional factor of two or maybe four in this case. And so we started with this initial high pressure region. And as that expands outwards, you get an expanding shock wave that moves out. And the adaptive mesh refinement moves these grids automatically as the solution evolves in order to put the refined region where we want it here. So um, it's a movie here, which hopefully will work. It shows this evolving in time. Yeah, so you see the shock wave moving out and the grids adapting as they move out. You can also see, maybe you can see, can we turn this light off here? There's one shining right on here, but maybe, is that okay? Okay. Um, so you can see the grid's adapting, and you can also see the grid lines drawn out here on the topography. That's the, the sort of region where the, the rectangular blocks of refinement in 3D are intersecting the topography. So it's moving out in three dimensions. We're just looking at cross-section again. Here's one other movie which just shows the same computation, but shown now on the surface, showing what the pressure is on the surface as this wave moves out. So you can see this, this high pressure shock wave moving out along the surface. So one thing that we hope to study, that we've been starting to look at some, is the initial blast wave when the, the, the mountain, which is here, this is looking northwards, as it, when it first erupted, there was a blast that moved out to the north. And this area that's shown in gray here is the devastated zone of directed blast. That means that's the sort of the region over which the trees were knocked down by this initial blast going over the topography. And you can see here that they've drawn arrows that show what direction the flow is going. And it isn't simply moving out. There's a lot of ridges and hills here, and the flow goes around them. And you have recirculation zones as it goes over ridges and so on. So some places, the trees were actually blown down towards the mountain, other places away from the mountain. And the way they got these arrows was by actually looking at the patterns where the trees were blown down as this wave moved out. So you got very nice sort of photographs like this of the tree patterns after the wave had gone by that show exactly how the flow was going, at least this initial flow as it first swept over. So using that, they could make these maps. Unfortunately, the logging companies came in and cleared out most of these trees within a couple of years. So there's a certain amount of data, but there wasn't as much collected as one might hope. But there's a fair amount of data available on exactly how this flow was going. Now, unfortunately, this sort of atmospheric blast wave that I was talking about wasn't really sufficient to knock over any trees. That was just kind of the sound wave that went out first. To look at the trees being knocked down, you really have to look at something like a pyroclastic flow, these flows that are the, the hot, dusty gas that's moving down the volcano here. This was at a later 
eruption later that the summer of 1980, uh, in which case you had a sort of rising column of gas, but some of it was heavy and dense enough that it flowed down the mountain. And this initial blast, it was a sort of pyroclastic blast that moved out over the topography, and that's what was really responsible for knocking the trees down. So the, doing a pure Euler equation compressible simulation isn't enough to see this. So we've had to go to looking at a model that incorporates uh, dust, solid particles, in the gas. And there's a lot of levels of modeling that one could do here. So far, we've looked at fairly simple generalization of, of the Euler equations, where we have two phases, a gas phase and a single dust phase with a single particle size. You could ultimately look at multiple different uh, particle sizes and, and have equations for each of them. But we have a, a separate set of equations for the gas phase and the dust phase, both of which are like compressible Euler equations. Um, the dust phase, though, is assumed to be pressureless. It's, it's got um, some constant microscopic density of the particles, and we keep track of the, the volume fraction of those particles. Uh, these two systems of equations are then coupled together uh, by drag forces between the gas and the dust and by heat transfer between the gas and the dust. You have this very hot dust that's coming out into the cooler atmosphere, so heat transfer is an important effect. Um, so we have a separate density for each phase, a separate set of velocities for each phase, and energy for each phase. Uh, we have a hyperbolic system, which is on, on the next slide, I think, that for each phase, and then they're coupled together with source terms that model these various forces. There's a lot of things we've neglected so far, viscous terms, turbulence, and so on. Uh, water vapor is another thing we've neglected so far that eventually we want to put in. But already you get fairly complicated looking equations, and I won't go through them in detail, but if you're familiar with Euler equations, that's what we basically have on the left side of the equal sign here. And then on the right side, we have the, the uh, drag term uh, proportional to the difference in velocities between the two phases, uh, heat transfer term proportional to difference in temperatures, gravity terms, and then the sep separate set of equations for the dust phase. And then those equations have to be uh, supplemented with various equations of state for the gas and the energy relation for the dust and, and formulas for what the drag coefficient and heat transfer coefficient are. So the details aren't too important there, but we basically have a, a hyperbolic system of conservation laws if we set the right-hand side to zero coupled together by source terms. And that's the sort of equation that we're looking at solving in general. So Mara Kaplani, as I said, did her thesis on this topic. And one thing that she looked at um, was the structure of these volcanic jets in more simplified uh, geometries. If we just have, say, a flat bottom and a jet coming out here, and say it's axisymmetric. She did mostly 2D axisymmetric simulations. So you get a rising plume here. Uh, and then depending on the flow conditions here, either that plume just rises on up if it's buoyant enough, or else it may collapse downwards. There's gravity pulling the dust downwards. There's buoyancy and the heat and the initial velocity here pushing it upwards. And so depending on the balance between those, you either get a rising column or a collapsing column. If it collapses, it may flow along the topography here. As it flows along, it entrains cooler air and heats it up. And, and as that air heats up, it can rise up in these, in these uh, secondary columns out here. And so you can get interesting fluid dynamics just in this 2D axisymmetric case. And this is just sort of a, a graph of what sort of behavior you expect based on the velocity and the, and the uh, density, I guess it is, of the flow that's coming out here. So depending on the, the, oh no, I guess this is, D is the diameter here, sorry, the diameter of the vent, V is the velocity of the flow out through the vent. At fairly low velocity, you'd have a collapsing column, whereas at higher velocities, you have a transitional or Plinian column that's rising upwards. So we did a variety of numerical experiments on this, um, just looking at these flows into an initially stratified atmosphere with uh, just free slip boundary conditions at the bottom surface. That's something that we're also looking at how to improve to 
include friction terms at the bottom. But this is just one example of sort of results she got. Um, so this is four snapshots in time. There's a jet coming out here, directed upwards. Again, this is 2D axisymmetric. That jet, in this case, collapses and gives you this pyroclastic flow that flows along the topography. There's a movie of it going. And this was at a fairly low velocity where it collapses downwards. If you look at a higher velocity, or perhaps this was a smaller vent diameter, I'm not sure, but one of those you get a column that rises up. And actually, in this case, you see that it's sort of, if you look at the structure of what's going on in here, there's actually shock waves bouncing around in here, and there's sort of a a mock disk here at the top where the flow is redirected outwards and you get the, the flow going out here and, and it's more buoyant because of high temperature there and so even though it's dusty it manages to rise on up. Okay, that was another thing that, that Marika looked at quite a bit in her thesis was sort of the structure within these jets. It's interesting that um, in a dusty gas, because of the way these equations are coupled together, it turns out the effective sound speed is much lower than it is in just pure gas. And so the, the velocities that we're looking at here, even though they would be subsonic relative to the atmosphere, they're supersonic relative to the speed of sound in the dusty gas. So you actually get really supersonic jets and all of the sort of shock structure that you would expect in those um, from these simulations. Okay, so that's sort of uh, an introduction uh, to one example that we've been looking at. Now I wanted to kind of very quickly go through a bit about the numerical methods that are being used and the, and the software, just to, again to give you the main ideas, and then look at a couple other examples. <coughs> so the equations that we're looking at are, are typically conservation laws. Q is, represents here my vector of conserved quantities, say mass, momentum, and energy. Um, F of Q is the flux function in 1D. Or in 2D, we'd have a flux in the x direction and a flux g of q in the y direction. Um, the conservation form written here, we have the time derivative of q plus the divergence of the flux equals zero, just uh, models conservation of, of mass, momentum, and energy, say. If you differentiate out here, then you get the Jacobian matrix F prime times qx here, that sort of quasi linear form. Uh, another related system is just a linear system of equations. Qt plus A of x, Qx, or in two dimensions, something like this, where you have matrices, coefficient matrices that may depend explicitly on where you are in space, variable coefficient problems, which will be important in the last example I'll talk about of looking at wave propagation in, in tissue and bone. So th these systems are called hyperbolic if this Jacobian matrix or the coefficient matrix or an appropriate arbitrary linear combination of the coefficient matrices in 2D, uh, if the eigenvalues of that Jacobian are real and there exists a complete set of eigenvectors, then we call the problem hyperbolic. And the eigenvalues basically give you the wave speeds at which waves propagate, and the eigenvectors uh, give a, the appropriate decomposition of arbitrary data into different waves propagating at different speeds. So anytime that we have problems that involve wave propagation, we typically end up with hyperbolic systems of this form. So what we're using to solve them are finite volume methods. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, let me just relate it to finite difference methods. In a finite difference method for a differential equation, you think of, say, QIN as representing a pointwise approximation to the solution at some point in space and time, and then approximate the derivatives by finite differences. And that works well as long as things are nice and smooth, and you can approximate derivatives by differences. Uh, but for conservation laws, you often have shock wave solutions where you have discontinuities in the solution, and then these assumptions break down. So the idea in finite volume methods is instead to look at QIN as being an approximation to the cell average of the solution, and then use the integral form of the conservation law, which is really the more fundamental physical form, which says that the time derivative of the integral of Q over some interval 
is equal to the difference in fluxes at the ends of the interval. So that's what the conservation law really says, that, that the total mass in some section is changing only due to fluxes through the ends within it that's being conserved. And from this, you can, assuming smoothness, derive the conservation law, the QDT plus the FDX equals zero. But in the finite volume method, we instead work directly with this form and update the cell average by the fluxes at the edges of the cell. And that gives a more powerful set of methods for problems that involve shock waves. So the classic method that, that the methods I've been looking at are based on is, is Godunov's method for a conservation law, uh, where the idea here, this is in the XT plane now. So we've got our grid cells here. On this cell, we've got some cell average QIM. And the idea is that over each time step, we solve what are called Riemann problems at the interface between each pair of grid cells. The Riemann problem is just the equation we're solving with piecewise constant initial data. So at this interface, we've got QI minus 1N in this cell, QIN in this cell. And the solution, it turns out, for hyperbolic problems just consists of waves propagating away from the interface. You have finite propagation speeds in the eigenvalues of, of the coefficient matrix for a linear problem or for a nonlinear problem. It's a little trickier to figure out exactly what the waves are, but you can still solve the Riemann problem. And you still get waves that move at constant speeds. They may be shock waves or rarefaction waves for a nonlinear problem, which still have the same basic structure. So we solve all the Riemann problems and get the waves and the speeds. P is the, the family. So if we've got, say, two waves here, P would be one or two um, at the I minus a half interface. We do that at each interface. And then we use those waves somehow to update the solution. So one way to think about it is that we just solve the equations exactly over a small time step where these waves haven't started interacting, and then average the resulting solution after these waves have propagated the wave over the grid cell to get QIN plus 1. Um, but there are simpler ways to formulate it. You can rewrite it in terms of computing fluxes at the boundaries. These solutions to the Riemann problem are similarity solutions. The solution is constant along these dotted lines that are the cell edges. If we evaluate the flux function at those points, we get a, a numerical flux at the interface. And we can update the cell average by differencing the fluxes at the two boundaries. And that gives you sort of the classical flux differencing form of these methods. You can also see this is sort of a direct discretization of the QDT plus the FDX equals 0. But we get the F, the numerical flux, based on solving this Riemann problem. Or another way to look at it that turns out to be more easy to generalize to other sorts of hyperbolic problems besides just conservation laws, things like variable coefficient linear problems, is to look at all of these waves and update the cell average by the contribution of all the waves that are propagating into the cell. So each wave is carrying some jump in the conserved quantities moving at some speed s. And if you work out the formula, what effect does that wave have on the cell average as it propagates in? You find that you can update the cell average by this term a plus delta q, which corresponds to the contribution of all waves moving to the right from interface i minus a half, uh, plus a minus delta q at i plus a half, which is the contribution of all left going waves originating at interface i plus a half. And these contributions are basically just the positive or negative part of the speed times the strength of the wave summed over all of the waves. So s plus, for example, is s if s is positive, but 0 if s is negative. So it's only in the a plus, we're only picking up the right going waves. OK, so this Riemann problem, again, it turns out always has a similarity solution for hyperbolic problems. Um, it, for nonlinear problems, it may involve shock waves and rarefaction waves. So one classic example is the shallow water equations, which model the, the flow of water in, in shallow, um, water that's shallow relative to uh, the wavelengths of interest. Although in the case of a Riemann problem, we're really looking at discontinuity. So that's, that's not completely appropriate. But it still turns out to be a fairly good approximation. Uh, in particular, if we look at a dam break problem where we have say, high water here, lower water here, a dam here that breaks at some initial time, 
then that would be an example of a Riemann problem. We've got two different constant states. And now as time evolves, what happens is that you get a shock wave moving to the right into this shallower water. Behind the shock wave, the water is accelerated. So there's a jump in velocity as well as a jump in, in the depth. Uh, and to the left, you get a rarefaction wave. In this region, the fluid on the left is being accelerated. So the fluid over here is still stationary. It's being accelerated here. It's moving at some constant speed here. And then there's a jump to zero speed over here. And you also have this interface between the uh, two initial bodies of water that moves along with the velocity in that intermediate state. And that just spreads out as a similarity solution as time evolves. So in this case, we have well, really two waves, a shock wave moving to the right, this rarefaction wave moving to the left. There's also what we might call a contact discontinuity here, where the two initial uh, bodies of water are in contact. Turns out there, there's no jump in the height or the velocity. So in terms of the shallow water solution, it, doesn't really show up, but if we were also advecting some tracer or had some chemical in one fluid and the other, then there would be a jump in that density at this contact discontinuity. So in the XT plane, we get a picture that looks like this. From this initial discontinuity, we have a shock wave, a rarefaction wave, a contact, and the solution. This, you can think of this as being sort of contours of the solution. It's a similarity solution. It's constant in each of these wedges and varies smoothly through this rarefaction wave. <clears throat> now, in practice, for nonlinear problems, although you can work out the, the exact solution for arbitrary initial data by solving typically some nonlinear system of equations, uh, that's a lot of work to do at every grid cell at every time step. And so often, various linearizations are used. For example, there's something called the row solver, where you solve some linearized system of equations where this coefficient matrix depends on the Jacobian at some average state. Um, and in that case, for a linear system, the discontinuities, the waves are all just discontinuities propagating at speeds given by the eigenvalues of that matrix. OK, so this is the method I had written down before, Godunov's method in this form, where we update the cell average by the contribution of waves coming from each interface on the left and the right. And notice in this form, all it requires is that we know the waves and the speeds. So given two states, qi minus 1 and qi, if we can split that up into appropriate waves and speeds, we can plug that, those waves and speeds into this formula, and we get an update. We don't need a numerical flux function. We do it in terms of the waves and the speeds, and that means it's also applicable to hyperbolic problems that aren't necessarily in conservation form, which is useful in some problems. So this is the basis of this general software. The user provides a Riemann solver that, given left and right states, provides waves and speeds. The problem with this method, though, is it's only first order accurate. It's basically the upwind method. Um, if we want better accuracy, then we can add a correction term to this. So this is the formula from before with a difference of correction fluxes, f tilde, at the interfaces, where this correction flux, again, depends just on the waves and the speeds, and is this combination and if this w tilde here is just the wave w, and if we were looking at just a linear system, then this is exactly the correction term needed to turn the upwind method into the Lax-Wendroff method. So it gives us a standard second order method. Now the problem with Lax-Wendroff is if you have discontinuities, Lax-Wendroff is dispersive and gives you oscillations in the numerical solution. So instead of using the full wave strength here, what we do is apply some limiter to the waves. And I won't get into the details of this, but this is sort of the basic idea of what are sometimes called high order Godunov methods or high resolution methods or TVD methods. Uh, and there's various variants of these methods. But the basic idea is that we start with the upwind method and add in some limited version of this correction that makes it second order accurate where things are smooth, but where these waves are limited if there's a large jump, large relative to the neighboring Riemann problems, which indicates that we're near a shock perhaps. So it reverts to something more like the upwind method near a shock. And these methods give very good resolution of discontinuities. They typically show second order accuracy where things are smooth and give nice sharp shocks with no non-physical oscillations if you choose the, the uh, limiters appropriately. 
So these methods, though, are still based on just knowing these waves and these speeds and now having some limiter function that you apply. And so they can still be applied very generally to a wide range of problems. And so this software that we put together is based on just implementing this uh, in a way that makes it fairly easy for a user to simply supply a Riemann solver. Uh, so there are versions of the software in 1, 2, and 3 space dimensions now. Adaptive mesh refinement is built in. We saw that with the uh, Mount St. Helens example. So once you have your Riemann solver set up for whatever problem you're looking at, which is basically how you specify the equations, then it's relatively easy to just turn adaptive mesh refinement on. Uh, there's also an MPI version for parallel computing. Um, in addition to the Riemann solver, you need to specify boundary conditions. That's done in a routine that just sets values in the ghost cells, some cells to the left and the right of the computational domain. And there's standard routines included for doing that for standard boundary conditions. And then you specify initial conditions. And if you have source terms, those are handled in a fractional step approach. Or in some cases, it turns out it's much better to incorporate the source terms into the Riemann solver, which is a topic I won't have time to go into, really, but one thing we've been looking at recently, especially for things like tsunami modeling, of how do you properly incorporate the source terms into the Riemann solver. So there's lots of applications of these sorts of things. These are some things I've been involved in or know other people have been working on with, with these methods. Um, again, pr pretty much anywhere that you have wave propagation or advective transport fluid dynamics, uh, solid mechanics in time-dependent situations, you get uh, problems that are hyperbolic in character and can be used in, in this form. So I'm going to give you just sort of a, a overview of a couple other problem areas now that we've been looking at um, using these. Uh, and the first is tsunami modeling. This is what Dave George has been working on, as I said. And we started working on this a couple years ago now in conjunction with Harry Ye, who was in the civil engineering department at Washington, recently moved to Oregon State, where they have a big wave tank facility. And the original idea was to do some computations related to some wave tank work that he was doing. Um, but since the uh, disaster in the Indian Ocean last December, we've kind of shifted gears and been looking much more at modeling the Indian Ocean in particular. But tsunamis can arise from lots of different sources. Earthquakes are the uh, one obvious possibility. But there are also tsunamis, sometimes quite violent ones, generated by landslides. There's a, a bay, Latuya Bay in Alaska, for example, where there was a huge chunk of rock that fell off into the water and created a wave that swept up over the other side of the bay. Uh, there have been some other major events like that. Submarine landslides, landslides under the ocean, can create tsunamis and have created tsunamis that have killed many people. Um, volcanoes erupting near the water or underwater volcanoes can cause tsunamis. And uh, very large tsunamis could potentially be generated by meteorite or asteroid impacts. So the tsunami last December was, of course, the most significant one in many years. But actually, there were, during the 1990s, something like 97 significant tsunamis with 16,000 casualties. So this is an ongoing problem that, that uh, it's worth studying. So a little bit about tsunami waves. In the ocean, a tsunami wave is typically hard to measure even. It's typically less than a meter high. Um, but as it approaches the shore, it can grow to be tens of meters high and can run up along the shore hundreds of meters inland. Um, the reason that that's so is that even though it's small amplitude, it's very long wavelength. The length of one of these tsunami waves can be a couple hundred kilometers. So even though you've only got a, a meter elevation, you've got that over a huge distance. That's a lot of water and a lot of energy. And the propagation speed, turns out shallow water equations can be used to model these quite effectively. Um, because what we're looking at is a very long wavelength relative to the depth of the ocean, which is at most four kilometers or so. Propagation speed in shallow water equations is the square root of gh, where h is the depth. So out in the ocean, it's moving fairly quickly. As it approaches the shore and h goes to 0, it slows down. And so all this water bunches up as it starts slowing down at the front, and this faster water is moving up behind. So just as you have a, a wave breaking on the ocean, which is due to the same nonlinear effect, um, you get this bunch up of the tsunami. 
in the Pacific or the Indian Ocean, which are about four kilometers deep, you get an average speed of about 450 miles an hour or so. So they move fairly rapidly across the ocean, but then slow down at the shore. So the uh, quake on December 26th was created by a rupture here. This is a map of the Indian Ocean of the Bay of Bengal, India, Sri Lanka over here. And this is a subduction zone where you have part of the Earth crust cutting under here. And you've got a lot of stress that's built up here. And every now and then that gives, and you get a rupture and an upward thrust of part of the ocean bottom that lifts up a whole column of water a few meters, but again over a very large area. And it's that lifting up of the water as the water now flows away from there that gives you the tsunami wave. So this fault didn't all slip at once. It actually started at the south end here and propagated northwards at about two kilometers per second. And it went on for 10 minutes. So the earthquake itself lasted for about 10 minutes lifting up water all along here as it moved along here. Um, some movies of, these are computations that Dave's run using, again, our adaptive mesh refinement code. So we're starting with a very coarse grid. Um, then we have, in this case, three levels of finer grids. The finest grid here, the grid lines aren't shown again. And we've allowed it to do this finest level only near the shore, where we're really interested in seeing what's going on. And out in the ocean, it sort of, we refine it enough to follow the wave, but not too fine. Uh, so the colors here are the depth relative to, to the uh, undisturbed surface. So red is elevated above, blue is below. I think that's right. So in this rupture, you actually had a, a higher elevation to the west and lower to the east. Is that right, Dave? Yeah. And so that actually had an effect on how the wave behaved as it approached the shore. As you look at these simulations, you'll see, for example, the wave moving over here towards Thailand. You got the depression moving ahead of the rise, and so the water actually swept out from the beach first, and then the tsunami wave swept in. Whereas other areas, you had a, perhaps the, the rise coming first before the, the trough. This first movie shows the fault area and shows the earthquake propagating. This, uh, the earthquake itself is using some data from Caltech uh, most recent model of what the actual earthquake was doing. Um, so we have that sort of time dependent motion of the body, of the bottom rather, put into the uh, code here. And then that propagates over the Bay of Bengal. And then this is a uh, Sri Lanka over here, you can see it refines as it approaches there. Um, here's a zoom in on just that region. So you can see the uh, topography is, and bathymetry bottom topography is refined as the wave moves near. So we have a very fine grid when we need it, but before that, we're calculating on a very coarse grid out there where nothing is happening. And then finally, this is a larger scale computation um, going all the way over to Africa here. It was actually on the African coast, it was mostly up here along Somalia, I guess, where most of the deaths occurred. And you can see this wave is sort of focused and is largest right along there, much weaker down along the rest of the coast of Africa. That's because of the, the bottom bathymetry of the ocean in between, how it channels the energy. Um, so that's what we're working on now. And we're trying to do that in various ways. I'll show one validation that we have and sort of indicate what else we're trying to do. This is shallow water equations. Um, oops. So it's shallow water equations. This is a cross section of the Indian Ocean. Here's Sri Lanka. Here's uh, Thailand over here. 
And this is on a kilometer scale, so this is four kilometers deep here. So we have a deep ocean, um, but if we, get rid of this. if we zoom in on the surface here, the tsunami looks like this at this particular time. This is now on the scale of, this is 10 meters here, so we're seeing a wave here that's approximately one or two meters high on top of this variation in bottom topography. So one of the big challenges in solving the shallow water equations, you can put bottom bathymetry into the shallow water equations that just comes in as a source term, um, but the variations in the bottom bathymetry are huge compared to the variations in this wave that we're trying to model. So you have to be very careful about how you incorporate the bathymetry into the shallow water equations. And in particular, if you just use a fractional step method where you solve the shallow water equations ignoring the bathymetry for a time step and then solve the basically ODEs that come from the bathymetry terms, that doesn't work at all well in this context because you have a steady state here, this constant depth in which the depth H is varying largely but the, the gradient of the flux is exactly balanced by the source term. And it's deviations from that steady state that we're looking at. And if you do a fractional step method, then the huge variations in H give a lot of wave motion. The source term should exactly cancel it out, but when you do that numerically, you'll totally lose this information about the propagation of these small scale features. So that's one of the main issues that we've been looking at to some extent is how do we do this appropriately. Um, so here's one piece of validation we've done just recently. Turns out there was a satellite that happened to be passing over the Indian Ocean during the tsunami event, um, which could actually measure surface elevation. Uh, so this is data collected by the satellite actually on two different cycles. It goes about once a week or so it happens to pass over the Indian Ocean. And the blue is a week before the tsunami when nothing particular was happening. And the red is during the tsunami. So the difference between the two, which is plotted over here, gives some indication of the tsunami itself. So before this, or in regions of the ocean where the tsunami hadn't yet hit, the two agree fairly well. You can see there's a big discrepancy here. So this is the main tsunami. This is fairly noisy data. It's, as you can imagine, hard to measure. This is on the scale of one meter being measured from space. So it's pretty impressive that they can get results like that even. Um, and if we compare our numerical results with that, we uh, actually did pretty well at getting this main peak of the tsunami. It's not quite as good out here for some reason, but uh, we've got the magnitude and the position pretty well there. So, I'm sorry. So this is as a function of latitude, I believe, or so it, this satellite was sweeping over the ocean, so there was actually a fairly, fairly long time delay. It took, I don't know, 10 minutes or so to pass over this region. So as it was moving, the tsunami was also moving. So what we had to do in the numerical simulation was at each point figure out where was the satellite, what was the, the height directly below it at that point, and keep track of that and compare that then with the satellite data that it's calculating as it moves across the ocean. So it's not really a snapshot at one particular instant in time, it's evolving. Now the other thing we'd like to do is be able to really look at, at run up along the shore. So that was sort of a global simulation of propagating over the ocean. But what we want to do now is zoom in on one particular part of the coastline and see can we predict the wave depths and the inundation at that point. So here, for example, this is Sri Lanka again, the Indian coast. There's a region there, Madras, somewhere along the coast up here, where Harry Ye, our collaborator, went in uh, early January and did a lot of field measurements of run up and inundation, took lots of pictures. So they have pretty good data. This is a chart of the Madras Harbor. This is the breakwater, the ship canal coming into the harbor. And they have a lot of data along here of exactly what the run up was. So what we want to do now is sort of zoom in on this particular part of the coast and see if we can get good agreement with that data. Um, so this raises other challenges for the, the numerical method. To look at the run up on the shore, we really need to look at how this wave is moving up and down along the beach. And what we're doing with the shallow water equations is just basically solving on a Cartesian grid. And in each cell, we have a depth h. And in some cells, the depth is zero. 
if it's dry, but that can change dynamically with time as the wave moves in and out. So cells become wet and dry as the wave moves back and forth. That also gives some challenges in getting the Riemann solvers to work properly with the, the dry state. So Dave's been working on digitizing those charts and getting some good data on the bathymetry there. Uh, we don't have that running quite yet, but uh, we do have <coughs> some examples from a, a workshop a couple years ago, a year and a half ago or so now, um, on tsunami modeling, where they had a model, a scale model, physical fluid dynamics wave tank model of a part of the Japanese coastline that was hit by a tsunami in 1993 on the island of Okashiri. And they reconstructed part of this coastline. Uh, and then they did measurements. They used a wave maker to run a wave in. They took movies of, of it as it came in. And they also had various depth gauges, various points around it, and took measurements of that. And so that was sort of a benchmark problem for this workshop. And a number of groups had pretty good results on that. This is, I think, the movie. This is the movie of our computation. So this was, there was a coastline up here, and then there was a little island out here, and some bottom bathymetry. And yeah, in this case, the water moved out first, and then you saw this wave sweeping in, reflecting off the coast, and then it sweeps over the island, in fact, on its way back out. So again, the computation is done just on the Cartesian grid with each cell having a depth that may be zero, may be greater than zero, and changes dynamically as the wave moves in and out. So we, we also looked at this sort of top views of this and compared it with movies that were taken of the actual experiment. Got things that looked actually pretty good. Uh, don't have time to show too much of that, but let me show you one set of tide gauge or depth gauge data. As I said, they had in the experiment uh, depth gauges set up at various points. Um, and so the red dots here are what were recorded in the experiment as this wave came in. So this is as a function of time at one particular fixed location. So originally nothing was happening. Then the wave went out. Then it sh the water depth shot up. And then there was sort of a reflected wave coming from around the coastline that gave you a big, another big jump in the depth, and then the wave went out and back in again and so on. And the black line is our computed result at the same location. So we were pretty happy with that. So what we think we can do now is take this model that's working well for small regions along the coast, couple it in using the adaptive mesh refinement with this global model over the whole Indian Ocean, and be able in a single computation to do the whole ocean, and then zoom in on this one harbor and get results of what's going on there. And hopefully we'll have something going within a couple of weeks on that. Okay. How much time do I have? Uh, it won't be too much longer, but I wanted to say a little bit about this other application that Kirsten has been looking at. She's also here and has a poster out here, so if you want to hear more about this, you can talk with her. Um, this is a project we've been working on with a group at the Applied Physics Lab at the University of Washington that looks at shockwave lithotripsy and, more recently, shockwave therapy. Lithotripsy refers to blasting apart kidney stones with a non-invasive procedure. Basic idea is you, you have a ellipsoid reflector here in this particular design with a spark plug here in water. And that spark plug creates a shock wave that propagates outward, reflects off this ellipsoidal reflector, and focuses at the other focus of the ellipse. And then you orient this in such a way that the kidney stone is right here. And you apply several thousand shock waves to the person, and it blast apart the kidney stone to small enough pieces that it can be passed out without having to do surgery. That's the idea, and it works pretty well. It's been done tens of thousands of times over the, I don't know, it's been at least a decade now that that's been a very common procedure. Um, 
So this shock wave that's created here uh, has a, it really is a shock wave propagating through water and tissue in the kidney stone. It has a very steep rise in the, the pressure over five to 10 nanoseconds and then a slower drop. And then there's actually a region of negative pressure relative to the ambient pressure, which in the water means that you typically have cavitation happening in bubble formation. Uh, and then you get a sort of a tail out here. Um, so there are various interesting questions involved in sort of modeling these things. Uh, for one thing, it's, it's not really known exactly how the stone is broken up still. There's a variety of different things going on. There's, of course, the stress within the stone as this shock wave moves through, and then as, especially as this tensile wave moves through that's pulling apart, uh, these kidney stones are made out of material that is very brittle and, and doesn't uh, hold up well when you apply tension to it. So to some extent, it's just being pulled apart. There's also, as I said, bubble cavitation going on. And when you have a bubble cavitating near a solid wall like the edge of the kidney stone, as it collapses, it tends to create a jet of fluid that's directed at the kidney stone. And so the kidney stone is being sort of pummeled by these little jets from collapsing bubbles on the sides. And there's various other things going on that could play a role here. So one thing we'd like to do is use some computation to see more about what's happening as these shock waves propagate in, in liquid and tissue and kidney stones. Um, why this has gotten so slow here. I think I may have a movie still running in the background or something. This is the uh, lithotripter, the research lithotripter that they have at the uh, Applied Physics Lab. This is Kirsten and Tom Matula, who's a researcher at the Applied Physics Lab that we've been working with. Um, this is sort of what the design of the original lithotriptors they used clinically looked like. It had, there's a cover on it, but there's the ellipsoidal reflector here with the spark plug in the middle. And then this is a tank that can be filled up with water. And then the spark uh, creates shock waves that focus out here. And in the original clinical design, people would actually sit in a tank of water while this procedure was being done. Now they have smaller handheld devices they just hold against your body, I guess. Um, but this is being used to do experiments. They can place a kidney stone or a, a model of a kidney stone at this point and, and do measurements of what happens to it uh, as the shock waves are hitting it. Let me just see if I can speed this up. I'm afraid I still have a bunch of movies running in the background. I don't know what's going on. Um, okay. Um, this is a picture of a couple of kidney stones. There can be often be pretty nasty looking things. But for some of these experiments, they've used very idealized models. For example, this is a cylinder of, of some uh, material that's like a kidney stone, but just a homogeneous material. And they've done experiments on those. They've also used clear plexiglass cylinders that they can then do experiments and, and measure the stresses, photograph the stresses as a shock wave moves through the, the uh, material. And so we started doing some computations of this sort of thing. So this is a, a 2D axisymmetric simulation axisymmetric about this line here so that this represents a cylinder. This is a, just in this case a planar shock wave that's hitting the cylinder. Uh, the material the cylinder is made out of has a much higher wave speed than 
the water that surrounds it. So you get this wave accelerated through the cylinder. Um, here, this initial wave has reflected off the end of the cylinder and is moving backwards. Um, in our model, we're using elasticity equations with just water outside, so the shear modulus is zero there, but a non-zero shear modulus in this material. So you get, in addition to this sort of pressure wave at the boundary, you get shear waves generated, and you can see waves um, generated in here in addition to those waves. So one interesting thing is that you get this sort of triangular or cone-shaped wave pattern. When they've done some experiments where they've taken these cylinders and they've, they've scored them around the edge at one particular location, and then as when the wave passes through, it breaks right there, but it actually breaks with sort of a cone-shaped pattern. So we're trying to do some comparisons now of what we're calculating versus what they've seen in some of these experiments. Um, there's a movie of So the model that we're using mathematically is 2D elastic wave equations with axisymmetry. Uh, we've started doing things in 3D as well. That's, of course, what we'll have to do for more interesting geometries. Um, at the moment, we're doing some comparisons between the axisymmetric and the 3D code to validate the 3D code. Um, so we're, we've, we're looking at both compression and shear waves in heterogeneous materials. We have sharp interfaces between, say, the water and the stone in that picture. Um, that's one advantage of these sort of Riemann solver based methods that you can deal very nicely with interfaces between different materials. Each grid cell has its own set of material parameters and solving the Riemann problem between the two corresponds to finding the appropriate waves moving away from the interface in each material. So you sort of automatically calculate reflection and transmission of waves at these interfaces every time you solve a Riemann problem. So these high resolution methods extend very nicely to looking at waves propagating in heterogeneous materials. Um, now, so far, I think the, the picture I showed you was just with the elastic wave equations. We really need to include nonlinearity because these really are shock waves uh, propagating through the water. Um, we started with just uh, sort of a, a large discontinuity in, in the linear equations, but we're looking now at how do we do an appropriate model of the nonlinearity in both the, the water and in the elastic solids. Um, that should be possible to handle with these methods as well. So in 2D, the elastic wave equations look like this. Sigma are the elements of the stress tensor. Rho is the density. U and V are velocities. Lambda and mu are Lamé parameters describing the material. And those can vary with x and y. So we can have these heterogeneous materials. Density also varies with x and y. Um, if you, you can write this linear system as just a, a linear system of this form with some coefficient matrices A and B. I didn't bother to write out. But if you look at a linear combination of these two that correspond to a plane wave propagating in the theta direction, then that matrix has eigenvalues that are uh, plus and minus CP and plus and minus CS, where CP are, is the compressional wave speed, the P wave speed, and CS is the shear wave speed. Um, so you get exactly this wave propagation structure coming out of it. Now, Lithotripsy has been done for a long time, but more recently people have started looking at using these lithotriptors or shockwave devices to treat various other things. Um, in particular, they found that in broken bones that don't heal, sometimes people will have a broken bone that several months or even years later still hasn't healed properly, presumably because the, the blood vessels aren't delivering enough, enough blood to the region or something. Uh, they found that if they treat the fractured region with shock waves that miraculously within a couple weeks it'll heal up. And they don't exactly understand why, but it somehow stimulates the region uh, to start growing again. Um, they've also used it to treat things like plantar fasciitis in the foot uh, and tennis elbow and various other maladies find that these shock waves stimulating the tissue can have a good effect. So in trying to model this, one of the interesting things is you've now got more complicated geometry than kidney stones even. You've got various bones. Uh, what you'd like to know, for example, if you're trying to deliver energy to a fractured region in a bone is what angle should we 
come in at in order to deliver the energy where we want it without getting maybe reflected focused waves focusing someplace where you don't want the energy deposited. Like there might be an, a nerve nearby that you don't want to zap in the process of trying to treat this fracture. So clinically, ultimately, it would be nice to have a computational tool that would let you put in the results from an MRI as your geometry and run a simulation at various different angles to decide on what's the best way to, to do the treatment. That's probably a long way off, but we're starting to try to look at, at solving, again, the elastic wave equations in, in more complicated 3D geometries in order to, to at least look at some idealized situations and see what effect it has uh, directing the shock waves in different directions. So this is one example calculation. This is a little bit uh, artificial because it's, this was just a 2D calculation of a slice through this 3D foot. This is a, a slice of MRI data of a foot. And from that, we extracted sort of data about where the bone is. And we used basically a simple model where every grid cell was either bone or water. Or actually, we put it in a larger computation where we also had this brass reflector. We have this is the lithotripter device, sort of a bag of water that gets pressed up against the foot. One focus of the ellipse is here, where the shock wave is generated. The other focus is right here somewhere. And then we have air out here. So we had really four different materials, brass, water, air, and bone. And the tissue is modeled as just water. Um, and then we looked at propagation of that shock wave as it reflects off the reflector and focuses in the foot. So again, it's sort of artificial because it's a 2D calculation. So this would be sort of like an infinite cylinder of this material. But ultimately, we'll take this to 3D as well. Uh, one thing we looked at here, actually, ultimately, you wouldn't want to model this whole thing. Rather than trying to model this reflection here, we'd maybe do that calculation once or take some measurements of what the shock wave is approaching the body and just do a calculation over this region. But we wanted to test out the code, so we also did the reflector here. Uh, and the idea is that we're just using a Cartesian grid. And the grid cells, this is a blow up sort of near this reflector. The grid cells that happen to be cut by an interface have material parameters that are some suitable average of the material on either side. So we've kind of smeared out this interface to some row of grid cells. Okay, but we wanted to see if we would get then the appropriate looking reflection of this wave at the interface. So here's one calculation. And again, we're using adaptive mesh refinement. So you'll see the waves that go off to the left, for example, aren't very well resolved because we didn't really care what was happening over there. Um, but we do get this reflection of the shock wave at the reflector. And it reflects fairly cleanly, even though we're sort of representing it on a Cartesian grid and uh, focusing then in here. And you can see the waves start moving faster through the bone than they are through the water and tissue, for example, because it has different material properties. Now, this was a case where this, uh, there's a good region of contact between this bag of water and the foot. Um, just for fun, Kirsten also did a simulation where we sort of overinflated the balloon. So there's very little contact here. And there's air in between. And then, as you'd expect, you get very little energy transmitted through there, and most of it reflects back in the other direction. So now we're working on extending this to 3D, and also, again, putting in more appropriate um, models for nonlinear propagation in, in water and bone. And ultimately, we could also have more detailed information about exactly what's here, rather than just assuming two different materials, generic bone and generic tissue. You could have each, each finite volume have its own material properties based on results from an MRI or something like that. OK. so. Uh, that's about all I wanted to say. So to summarize, 
Um, again, lots of wave propagation problems can be formulated as hyperbolic systems. And there's many applications. Uh, we've only kind of looked at a few today. But there are many things that can be done with this sort of approach. And one thing I've been very interested in is sort of making the software publicly available and easily usable by other people so that it can be applied to other problems. Again, once this, the methods are formulated in this general framework, it's fairly easy to change geometries, change problems, and apply it to different problems. Um, there's a bunch of these simulations that I showed and some other uh, results and papers can be found on my website there. I'll stop there. Thank you.